start. This is the final presentation. Um, I feel a great responsibility to uh, close DocuTech properly after these uh, great four days of amazing presentations. Um, so I think I'm going to talk about something that I, I hope is relevant to everything we've been discussing in the last four days. Um, this was a, a tweet from Stefan Urbach, who was here talking on the second day, and he, he made this very simple kind of uh, point that at the end, everything we're talking about at DocuTech is about power, which is kind of, I think, everything we're always talking about. Life is always talking about power and trying to challenge power and change power, and especially people who are working in the kind of hacktivist space, any of the kind of critical voices, it's always about trying to expose power, challenge power. That's what we saw um, in the surveillance talks on the second day, realizing the extent of power that governments and companies now are able to exert over us by the sheer amount of data that they collect on us. Um, looking at the yesterday, the transparency efforts, um, the little CIS project, which uh, um, is really trying to talk about how to expose power abuses in government. So power for me is really important because I come from South Africa, um, which of course is a country which had the most fucked up power relations. I mean, there are other countries with also fucked up power relations, but um, South Africa has a, a really weird history. This is a whites only bench. Um, power, power, uneven distribution of power in South Africa reached really absurd heights with things like this, where you know it was this really disciplinary society where the government felt like they had to create these, these signs for you around your natural environment just to tell you exactly who you were and where you weren't allowed to be in space. Like whites only here. So, of course, me growing up in South Africa was very aware of the power that I had myself. Um, and in this country and in a lot of, a lot of countries where there's an uneven distribution of power, humor becomes a really important tool. It makes us feel less desperate because we can't do anything. How, how do we overcome something like apartheid? But at least we can laugh together and it creates solidarity. Um, and there's something kind of nice about being able to laugh at the really the people who are oppressing you. So um, yeah, th this is a kind of tradition that has carried on in South Africa until today. Um, this is our most beloved cartoonist called Zapiro who releases very timely commentary on everything that's going on in politics in the newspaper, and it's something that most of society reads, so you can like you know laugh about the latest Zapiro cartoon that came out today. Um, and this is this is South African president, um, and he's he's had a shower head on all the cartoons of him and since since um, b at the start of his presidency um, in the early 2000s. He um, made this classic. Um, he made this classic case that you could shower after having sex with an HIV-infected person, and this would stop you from contracting HIV, which everyone knows is obviously scientifically <laughs> completely false. So now he always appears with a shower head in all the images, and it's like the country will not let him forget this really stupid comment that he made. So, yeah, I see... Um, Talk is, I see this kind of tactic of laughing, poking fun, subverting power, um, and working within the system that's already there as really powerful. So here we have, um, these people are called the, wait, let me just see if I can remember. It's like the Insurgent Rebel Clown Army. Um, and there were, there were a group of uh, activists in the UK who started doing this. They would just, when the, when the riot police were out, they would go and they would get into their clown gear and then they would just stand there and they would mimic, um, you know, the exact position, uh, the standing position of the cops. Um, and, I mean, it's silly, of course, but there's something really nice about it that I like. I like the fact that if you're passing by or you see this image, yes, you're laughing at the clowns because, you know, they just don't care. They're, they don't care about making fun of themselves or looking stupid. But at the end of the day, they just make the cops look so stupid too. You end up laughing at the cops because you're just like, oh yeah, you're, you're really clowns too. You're exactly the same. And so they're really kind of, you know, um, exaggerating 
the ridiculousness of the um, system of um, police force. Yeah. So, so this is something that I, I'm really interested in, and I, I, I'm interested in the subversive power of humor and play, having fun, um, taking the mickey, as the British would say, or something like this. <laughs> um, yeah. And working within the system in order to undermine or expose it, or just using their own medium for your own message. And so this is something we see most obviously, of course, in like culture jamming of billboards. Do you, do you people know this kind of thing where you you know you have a advert and then you go and check? You can just this is a professionally one done, but you can also just do it with like a pen and you just you know write something different. Any examples? Do you find that funny? Oh, that's good. Okay. I, d I couldn't really actually find a funny one. I was like, oh, that's not so funny, but anyway. Um, so, yeah, so I'm working with a group of artists and activists um, in Berlin called Peng. And here you see the iconic image of someone getting a pie in their face, which is a kind of visual symbol that I like to identify with because this is what we do a little bit. We, um, you know, we like to expose power. We like to undermine power. We like to say, "Hey, you know, big tech companies, stop stealing our, stop stealing our data. Look at what you're doing, and look at everyone laughing at you." Or, you know, "Hey, government, what the fuck?" Um, so, and we also we like the idea of working within the system. So, when we talk about trying to do activism against companies. We like the idea of using companies' own brands, and like you know the, the way that they look, the way that they act. Sometimes as activists, we think that we need to be like di diametrically opposed to our targets. You know, we must not be organized at all. We must be completely disorganized because you know the corporates and the professional people are organized. Um, you know, we mustn't dress smart. We must wear black all the time. We, um, you know a lot of these kinds of things. So I'm interested in the ways that you can actually play within the system that's already created for you and then kind of wreak havoc in it. So yeah, this is our business forecast. These are the, the little tools that we like to, like to use. Um, a lot of these terms, they're all being invented by other people. There's a long tradition of interventionists, artists, activists, political dissidents, you name it, all kinds of people, students have been using these different types of techniques. Um, context hacking is one I really like. It's by an um, Austrian group called Monochrome. And they talk about, um, this. it's always about trying to find the best medium for your political message. So they, their whole research is always about trying to find the best medium. And they have worked in all kinds of mediums. They have made games. They have like done fake art installations with fake artists. They have impersonated all kinds of people for their political um, messages. Disinformation is one that um, we see all the time. You know, businesses and governments, that's their speciality, right? They're always putting out false information to us. Um, but we often think, oh, no, we shouldn't do that. We shouldn't work in those gray areas. We have to do everything right if we're activists. But um, we're saying, OK, let's play them at their own game. And let's be just as dirty as them, but within the bounds of legitimacy. So, so these are some of the people that we've been working for. Um, the Shell Company, Federation of German Industries, Google, Democracy. Um, yeah, Shell, Shell we had a great relationship with. They, they want to maybe um, pursue long-term consulting agreement with us. Um, because, yeah, we, we really showed them a little thing or two about corporate social responsibility. So Shell is a, a, a great company that actually they kind of like invented greenwashing along with BP which is this term that, um, you know, you can carry on drilling in the Arctic and, you know, doing whatever you want to do, leaving messes in Nigeria for people to, you know, the local people to solve on their own. Um, and then, you, you, you know, you go to Europe and you do nice little media events and you, you say, oh, we really care about renewable energy. Look at us putting money into this. Um, so this is, um, this is a science slam that Shell did in Berlin where they... Basically, they held a competition for young students to come and present ideas for alternative renewable energies. And uh, we came up with an idea, and then we came and we you know, faked being a student with this awesome idea for a car that would like clean the air instead of polluting it. And then, and then um, yeah, the invention ended up exploding um, 
oil all over the stage. <laughs> so that was fun, and um, Shell really liked us after that. But <laughs> that's uh, that's kind of cheap. I mean, it's it was it was it was fun. It was like a spectacle. But um, we're kind of we're trying to deepen our tactics a little bit more. Um, and we also think that you know the, the, envir the environmental issues are really covered by Greenpeace. They've been doing an amazing job for the last 10 years, like really exploring new tactics, really pushing the boundaries of what's possible in terms of activism and direct action. Um, and we feel like some other sectors really just haven't been moving so much in this direction. And we really want to we want really want to explore that. So, um, yeah, the famous circle of four. These are, um, you know, the executive directors of Facebook, Twitter, Amazon, and Google. Um, yeah, they're kind of golden boys of neoliberalism, which yeah we've we've heard a bit about this week, and I think we've, I think it was clarified at least by Dan on, on Wednesday that um, you know the the kind of tracking that company these kinds of companies are doing is no better than the surveillance that is happening by. Um, intelligence agencies like the NSA, but they're really good at identity management, so they don't actually get such a hard time so much. So we're keeping an eye on them. Um, so our first client was Google recently. Um, yeah, Google particularly are very, very good at um, hiding who they actually are. Um, so yeah, this this is just a reminder that you know 96% of their income is based on you know, our data, basically, on collecting our data in order to sell it to advertisers in order to make money. That's how they make their money, um, and that's their business model. And then they're also trying to enter into every single possible other market of innovation available. So yeah, recently they made smart contact lenses for diabetics. So you can uh, control your contact lens from your phone or whatever, and then it releases your insulin uh, drops, which is it's great, and they've done you know driverless cars and all these kinds of things. But one does start to wonder, you know, if you start to put the puzzle together, they're collecting the whole world's data, and then they're you know they're really in love with this idea of the Internet of Things, and it's all these white boys in Silicon Valley like providing all the solutions for the whole world. Start to wonder. Really, like they say that you know they don't want to be evil, but it kind of feels like that's just going to happen. But of course, they're really good at identity management, right? Like they've done this whole thing of like, oh, you know, we're the best place to work at. We give our employees bikes. We're amazing, and you know, we don't make them work so hard, and we give them gumball dispensers next to their desks, and um, you know, we have a sense of humor. This is. Um, one of their April Fool's jokes, they always release April Fool's jokes. Um, this one was, you know, ad birds. So you could get your, instead of ad words, you could buy birds to carry your ad birds on. So they're really good. They have a great sense of humor. They're really funny. Everyone thinks they're awesome. They provide us all these great products. Um, but they're not so good on the whole issue of how they use our data and the privacy question, etc. And, you know, they're starting to get a little bit more criticism, at least in Europe. They're starting to get a few more people asking questions about why are they entering all these markets? Why are they just? Why do they cha sneakily change their privacy policies around our data, etc.? And also, just you know, monopolies are bad. Like we know that. So, um, yeah, none of these pictures are really showing up. But um, so, what did we, we decided? You know, we wanted to do something. We thought, okay, what can we do? that would you know, play within the system that Google has already created, work with their own medium, and you know, turn out our own political message, which is about them and their responsibility in terms of how they are collecting our data and what they're, how, what they're doing with it, and um, also, of course, their relationship to surveillance, government surveillance. So um, we looked at the upcoming Google, um, the tech conference Republica in Berlin, and we thought, hey, let's do a prank where we pretend to be Google, and we go on stage and we present some new products. So, and the products will be Google response to privacy, and Google saying, oh, we want to restore the internet to what it used to be, to what it started out 20 years ago to be, which is a great place for sharing information and knowledge, etc. 
um, and making people connect with each other. So we came up with some product ideas, etc. We applied to Republica, we created fake identities. Um, we called our line of products Google Nest, which was really helpful because they just bought a little um, company called Nest Labs a few months ago, um, which is known for this smart thermostat, which you can, again, you can like have a thermostat, you can actually, con I have a friend who has, his mom has a, one of these thermostats in her house in the States and he lives in South Africa and he controls it from his smartphone. It actually regulates the temperatures of his mom's house. So that's what the Nest, that's what the Nest product can do. Um, so we took the, the, whole, the whole name of Google Nest and we um, came up with this company idea and we applied to Republica with our session idea. Um, and here's the, here's the website that we created. Can people read it? Oh, okay, cool, I can't. Um, yeah, so we created a whole fake website and we came up with these four products. Google Trust, Google Hug, Google Bee, and Google Buy. Um, so they all look really googly, as you can see. Uh, our designer worked really hard on getting the, <laughs> the look perfect. Um, Google Trust was, um, it's insurance against surveillance. So you can take out insurance uh, against the possibility that you get surveyed by the government or even if you're um, you know, a victim of uh, data theft by a hacker or something. So Google's saying, we can't really secure you from these things happening. We have to hand your data over to, this, to the government if they ask for it, but we can say that we'll compensate you and your family in the case you know, that something happens. Um, so it's like kind of ironic, <laughs> yeah. Um, and of course, um, you, know, you, you get, your, your, risk, your risk is calculated by Google, obviously, so they know if you're at high risk of being you know, a victim of surveillance, so then you know, your insurance uh, payout is different. So then we had Google Hug, which is um, a little smartphone app that just monitors your emotional well-being and then finds, um, connects you with other people who have similar emotional needs to you. Like if you wanna go for a coffee or you really need a hug, then it finds someone and connects you. And then Google B is um, the Google drone. Um, well, I don't have to say so much about that. We know about drones. That's an idea of your, your own little surveillance machine. You can you know, send it after your wife when you go away on the weekend and you can just check where she's going. Um, and Google Buy is um, the thing we've all been waiting for, obviously. Like we're you know, giving all this data to the internet all the time and then we die and we're curating our lives while we're living and then we die and then what happens? Like, fuck. So Google says, oh, okay, well, we're gonna just, you know, create like a nice digital memorial to you when you die. We'll create a page and it will say all the amazing things about you. And then, um, you know, we'll send it to all your friends and we'll even send it to the people who we know should have been your friends, but they weren't. Cause we can figure that out just by like our social analysis tools. Etc. Um, yeah, so we created this website, but we didn't just create the website, of course. We also went to Republica. Um, and this was the kind of schedule of events. We put out the website at 12.30 on the 7th of May, and we managed to, I don't know how, convince three political parties, um, the left, the Greens, and the Pirate Party in, <laughs> in Berlin to um, support us and two NGOs as well. So they actually were in on the joke and they sent out press releases against us and started tweeting for us, like, you know, they started like the, the ball rolling before we even went on stage. And then um, at three o'clock we went on stage and we ended up on the big, the huge stage at Republica, which I'll show you some video footage now, um, was really <laughs> frightening. Um, and we also managed to convince a German TV celebrity uh, star to play along with us. Um, to play a role in the audience. So I'll just show you the video quickly. Also Google Hug. Google Hug, what is that? It's basically an app. It always knows where you are, how you feel, at any given moment. We will analyze your data and we will find out your basic needs and the matches which are nearby, uh, depending on your um, movements, on the tone of your voice, 
and your digital communication, we will always know what your top five needs are right now. And maybe we just try it out. Is there anyone in the room who wants to try out who has an Android in his pocket and wants to? You want to be the first one, the first person in the world in public trying out Google Hug? Wow, okay, that Anyone? was great. All right, give a, give a hand to this man. All right. So, sir, um, can I have, do you have a Google ID? Okay, good. Can you give me your Google ID? Laurence Pagemann. That, that's your name? Laurent Pagemann? Okay. Gloria, uh, would you be so kind to just um, bring it in? Um, Lawrence, oh, is it, uh, do you have your device on right now? Yeah. Here we go. Tap it in. Okay, uh, with that. Okay, I'm quite excited if it's going to work. So let's see what's happening. Um, oh, uh, sorry, no, that's, that's, not, that's not what you're looking for. Uh, could you just uh, go up there on the right? Um, have a look up there to the products. To the products. Uh, go to Hug. Yeah, that's it. Sorry, sorry, yeah. Paul. Mm. Okay, excuse me. Sorry, sir. Um, so basically, we are now analyzing Mr. Pagman's needs, and we will see if somehow someone close to us in this room eventually is. Um... Oh, it's Jan Josef Liefers. Is that right? Is uh, Mr. Liefers in the room? Is it Mr. Liefers? Is it? Um, excuse me. <laughs> that's, that's quite a, uh, can you can you please, please wait wait a sec? That's uh, quite a surprise. Can you? Um, so may I ask you? Uh, is that all right? It's, how do you feel? How do I feel? I'm uh, surprised. I feel uh, quite okay. I have a lot of things going on at the moment, a lot of work, a lot of appointments. I've got to host the German Film Awards day after tomorrow, so I'm feeling, yeah, used. <laughs> uh, so, sorry, um, but, but is that right? Could you, could you need a hug? A hug? Well, it says like <laughs> 85, 83%. I mean, I, yeah. Yeah, who couldn't? I mean, who couldn't use a hug? Yeah. Why Is that not? okay if, if we just. Uh, well, well, Mr. Pagman, uh, please, Lawrence, go. Give this man a hug. Come on. This is... Please, please, just. Come on. Yes. Wow. This is. I think. I just. I don't need to, to explain the product anymore. Uh, you all got. It explained itself. This is wonderful, Gloria. Wow. This is wonderful. Wow, That's, that was amazing. Oh, I is love my enough? job sometimes. For now? Uh, yes, please. Just I'm feel young, free. Right. Just feel free. You can exchange uh, information. But this is not all about Google Hug. It's just casual. It's just basically Thank you. Where, where you are, whenever you are there, however you feel. So. Thank you very much, Mr. Liefers, Mr. Pagemann. Um, I'd say let's move on with our presentation. Nice meeting you. Thank you. It's fine. Just give it, just give it to someone there. Okay. Our third. Third in the Nest family. Paul? Ready? Yes. Our next product. It's not Google Glass. No, it's not Google Glass. This is, you know, you know it all. Nothing new. No, what I'm talking about right here is Google B. Should I try it out? Mm -hmm. All right. So <clears throat> let's see if it works. So far, there were a little bit of technical problems. Um, so now I'm saying, oh, I've got wow, honey. there she is, our Google Bee. <laughs> wow. So she's, we're working really hard and trying to make her a bit smaller. It's really she's loud. Big right now. So come here, come here, come here. Wow. Come here, come here, come here. Ah. Okay. So, drones have been getting a really hard time in the press lately. And I'm just asking you, take a second and imagine the possibilities of a personal drone for everyday life. 
the Google Bee and fly at 1,200 feet high, and she's equipped with video live streaming capacity. So we imagined it a little bit, and we came up with some features. She can, of course, stay behind when you're away and watch over your home and family. She can make sure that your kids are going where they really say they're going. And she can fly to a concert that you're going to miss and record it for you, and then you can stream it live into your living room. Pretty amazing. And we'll definitely have more features where those came from. I think it's time to come to the final product. Where is it? Here, Google Buy. We got the issue that more and more people were coming towards us and asking, what is happening with my digital life when I die? And so we came up, or maybe I just show you. Hmm. In the future, all your friends will first of all be informed. If you push that button, you will come to Google Buy, and this would look like if uh, Gloria would pass away today, which I really hope won't happen. This is actually her horse, you can't really see it. But it is, um, we take the best, of her, uh, the best quotes of all her males, we, we make a summary of who she is, of what she believes in, uh, we take pictures, videos, and all the friends can, can commemorate and show their sorrow. So, this is the idea to really understand um, who does not want to leave this world with a beautiful picture of her or himself. And that's our answer. Right, so you can visit our website to see more information. So, that's the kind of basic idea. Um, it definitely was not polished. We were like rushing before we went on stage to, you know, tweeting and it was not so well planned, but uh, we did our best. Um, so at the end of the presentation, we um, experimented what we, with what we called an open source hoax. So we kind of told everyone, turn off the live stream, etc. This is a hoax, and we invite you to continue creating confusion online, using so social media at its best to spread disinformation, um, and keep, keep the joke going. Yes, you can you know, now tweet, oh, ha, ha, I saw a funny thing at Republica, it was a joke, but wouldn't it be funnier if you, you know, really acted as though this was a Google thing? Um, this kind of worked. It didn't work so well, but it was, an interesting, it was an interesting experiment for sure. I really liked the idea of kind of more participatory activism like this. Um, but anyway, it really helped to have the politicians and the NGOs that I spoke about earlier involved, because you know there they were um, tweeting. This is um, this is someone from the Pirate Party um, tweeting, you know, or like acting as though it really was Google. And then you've got the PR from Google Germany saying, "Hello, it's actually a joke. <laughs> Why are you believing it?" Um, and so we had a lot of we had a lot of fun on on Twitter. Um, with kind of different people pushing our story and then you know Google trying to cover it up and say no It's a satire and then other people saying well, why is it so believable then? You know, do you really have to come out and say it's a satire? Doesn't that just like make it obvious that what you're doing is you know creepy? Um, yeah, so these these were the basic results that we were really really happy with as like a small group of activists who um, Had done this whole thing to, like on a tiny budget of 900 euros um, we were really happy that it reached number one on Twitter Germany, and we got 35,000 web visits in the first day, and we reached all the major press, and we even jumped the pond, which is great. Like we reached South Africa and um, India and Indonesia. <laughs> um, yeah, and then we we kind of carried on having a little back and forth with Google over Twitter, um, and yeah, then they we realized that we'd really struck a nerve because they censored us from the search results, so. Um, in the first few hours, you know, you search Google Nest in Google and you would find it. And then uh, a few hours later, you could find it in every other search engine in the first ranked uh, website when you search Google Nest, except for Google search engine. So um, then we tweeted screenshots. We got other people to tweet screenshots of what it looked like on the other search engines. And then Google fixed it. So we had our own little Google PR person for the duration of this week who would constantly like, respond to all of our comments and um, critiques. And we actually met him as well. Um, and then, of course, you know, well, it was fun and games, but not really. Um, trademark infringement, of course, with the website. 
and the name of the nest. So we got a very nice email from Google um, telling us to take a number of steps, like you know, put a big banner on the website saying this is satire, which I think is really funny because um, like obviously it's satire. And then um, you know, uh, we should publicly renounce ourselves as Google employees. You know, fun and games are over now, guys. Reveal yourselves. Um, so we took this a little bit longer, and we got people to mirror the website, which means you know they created, they hosted versions of the website themselves. It's the Barbara Streisand effect. It's called normally when you try to censor something, then uh, you know society tries to spread it and preserve it on the internet. It's a great thing about the internet, um, and. Then we, you know, we publicly renounced ourselves as Google employees. We did a um, resignation video, which was really fun as well. We said that we were really embarrassed because we made such a bad impression at Republica, and we realized that Google was really unhappy with us. So now we were leaving Google, etc. So we like played the game for a bit longer. Um, and then uh, we actually had the help of the amazing organization, Electronic Frontier Foundation. Um, who were just incredible in consulting us on the kind of legal remit in terms of uh, trademark infringement, which obviously we knew nothing about. Um, and then they wrote a letter um, on our behalf in terms of kind of, you know, respecting, calling on Google, shame on you, respect the right to parody, et cetera. Um, and we, um, yeah, we ended up taking the website down, sadly, but we kind of wrote a letter to the internet <laughs> Um, with the documentation of everything that had happened, and the mirrors still live on, so that's nice. Um, and yeah, so I think like I just like to reflect on what's important um, in terms of getting that kind of reach for just a small little action. Um, yeah, the kind of the the fact that we had these collaborators. This was really interesting, and this was not something I would have ever, ever thought of before, of like trying to get other people involved to kind of carry the fake for you. Um, so having the politicians and the German NGOs involved, and this was amazing. Um, and this kind of came down to social contacts. It was actually my colleague Jean was just at a party. You know, he happened to know someone who knew important people, and he was at a party, and he just convinced them with this really fun idea. And this is the thing as well, that if you have a fun idea and you're really excited about it, you can actually really convince people, and they want to be part of it, even like a German TV star. Um, and yeah, the timing for us was really great because it was like a rising kind of critique of uh, Google in the media in Europe, at least at the time. And they just bought um, Google Nest. I mean, they just bought Nest Labs. Um, press strategy, which we didn't have, which I really hope that we have next time. You really need to know why you're doing this and like have a very clear line of what you want to tell the press. So any kind of you know aspiring activists, please keep this in mind. I always try to impress this on people because the press can really be your friend. It's amazing how when you get into the news and you just start spreading, how much kind of you know, yeah, how much reach you can have, um, and you can really like like we started getting it right. And the press actually, I mean, with this action, it was great because the press started doing the critical work for us. Like they started using um, they started using the website. It wasn't just like oh another group of activists do a prank against a company. It was like oh, um, you know, actually, what is wrong with Google? And why is it that these creepy data collection products are believable? Why are some people actually believing them? Um, let's look at the history of Google's privacy. Da, 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 da. So the press ended up actually doing our work for us, which is great. Um, and then, yeah, like, um, with these kinds of things, it's the details are really, really important. Um, you know, we had to come up with a reason, of course, like why we weren't American on stage. Duh. Um, so I had some, like, story about how I was, like, I don't know, raised in Australia or something. And Jean, Jean, you know, he was working for Google Hamburg, so that was okay. Um, but then, um, yeah, the kind of like the details, you know, we faked this whole like live interaction of the Google hug. So um, we worked really hard on making it look authentic. Um, this as well, like we worked really, really hard on making this actually look like a real product, which I think it does, because it looks a lot like a Google Plus profile. Um, and yeah, and then we had you know we had Google business cards made, of course, as well, which is very important when you want to look like a Google employee so that you can give them out. Um, yeah. So obviously the question of impact, like obvi obviously we had reach, and I think that's 
that's great. And I really, really want more people to be doing this kind of thing because I just think it's such an interesting form of activism. And it has like the amount, you know, the fact that we were able to get all that attention just in a few days. I've worked for a lot of NGOs and like we really, really struggle often to get your campaigns out. And, um, you know, you've done amazing research, you've got all the right networks, etc. But it's just like, there isn't like a spark and it doesn't it doesn't travel and the issue just doesn't get taken up um, and so I think I'm well I'm really interested to explore the, these kinds of ta tactics more and I really think that like civil society needs to be a little bit more it's difficult because of funding etc and you have to work within legal limits etc but um, I think there are a lot of tactics that are available to us that we that we should be exploring more and and we shouldn't be afraid to take risks and be a little bit more radical because it can really pay off. Um, but yeah, in terms of the actual impact question, of course, which everyone asked, of course. Um, yeah, so Google implemented end-to-end um, you know, -end encryption in their email recently, um, which obviously we think was because of us. So we faked this tweet as well from Google. We said, um, you know, we, we took an old tweet that they'd tweeted to us, and this was a tweet that they'd said, that um, the Google Nest thing was a satire, and then we just like edited it in GIMP and made it look like Google had tweeted that um, they had implemented end-to-end -end encryption because of us. And um, yeah, and then we, you know, we said, oh, look at this tweet that Google just deleted. Are they really saying that we're responsible for encryption? Um, <laughs> which, yeah, just like, you know, a little cheap fun on the internet. Um, but no, so in terms of impact, of course, like Google hasn't done anything, but I do think that we hit a nerve, which was great, and I think that um, for a company like that who's so good at identity management, I think it's really nice to see that there can be some uh, critical voices. Um, and we really saw like a lot of, a lot of critique rising up from uh, other people, you know, who, who took this as an opportunity to really kind of let all the laundry air about Google. Um, and then, and this is a this is a friend of mine from uh, Open Knowledge Foundation. I just got this this uh, direct message recently, saying uh, you know she we printed these Google Bee stickers and then she's um, she was obviously in a meeting with someone from Google and then she had a very awkward moment where they where they saw the sticker uh, on her on her computer. So I really like these little like moments of disruption that we can that we can create. Um, and yeah, so that's I think that's actually all I have to say. Um, yeah, I just wanted to tell the story, and yeah, any questions? Um, not that you have to reveal like your future plans for the collective or anything, but are there some future some some issues that you guys want to tackle in the future? Obviously, yeah. privacy is a, a big one, yeah. but are there some others that you guys um, are are thinking about and kind of mm. kind of ripe for this this kind of work? Yeah, well, so so we had this issue where it's just like we were you know there's so many things that you can do all the time, and it's just like that's why we decided to a little bit move away from the environmental issue because we thought you know Greenpeace has really got that and they've like had a long history of doing stuff, so. Um, yeah, oh, there are a lot of things that ev we, we did this mapping. We're like, what does everyone care about? And then it was like 20 issues, so that was a problem. So then we um, uh, we focused a little bit down, and now we're we're really looking at the kind of like you know freedoms and rights in the digital space, and also um, on migration in Europe, because we think both of those are issues that like kind of need you know need kind of creative amplification. So. <laughs> Anyone else? Thank you, then. And DocuTech is over. <laughs> Thank you very Thank you. much. <laughs> wow, what a way to end uh, DocuTech. It's really impressive. You know, Gant is trying to set up this. Uh, yeah. All right. If someone wants a Google Beat sticker, find Faith and get it from them. Oh, yeah, I need to place a remote to have. Yeah. Right. Well, a couple of, th uh, couple of uh, things before we end. This 96 hours of marathon, from 96 hours, we only slept <laughs> maybe 12 hours in total. Uh, they are, this event will not be able to happen if uh, we didn't have a, a full support from, uh, from our staff, from our 
volunteers, from our everybody who was involved from the very beginning till the end. But uh, the organization that I would like to thank on behalf of Dr. Tech is the Norwegian Embassy with the tremendous support that they give to us, uh, United States Embassy, uh, German Corporation, Giz, App6. You, you have seen the app. Don't delete it because next year we will use the same one. We just updated. Uh, Ipco Telecom for the in, uh, internet provided uh, for, for the internet that they provided for us. Uh, Soven in Foundation, Stick, Innovation Lab, Crimson, Frutomania, Techno Market, uh, Water Rugova, uh, Telegraphy, Digitale, Kosovo 360 Live, and Kosovo 2.0. So, what are we doing next? I would like as well to thank our uh, speakers who came all the way from across the globe, uh, from San Francisco, from, uh, from Berlin, from, from, uh, from London, from all over the world to come and speak for the first edition at DocuTech. We will learn every year, we will do it every year, but I would like also as well to thank and I would like to invite all the volunteers and the staff that work to close the DocuTech and to announce the new edition of DocuTech 2015, which will happen next year, and we will announce the date soon, as soon as we can. And so everyone from IFCO Foundation, Share Foundation, DocuFest, all prisoners, everyone who is invited to join us on the stage to close with a big wave of hello uh, to, the, to the world that is, is, is watching. So all the speakers, all the speakers, everyone, just join us, the panelists, on the celebration. Whoa, wow. <laughs> this is cool. Yeah. And our camera guy will actually take some pictures if, we're, if he's somewhere. All right. Maybe a round of applause from us to the world, for the world, to us, for this good edition of DocuTech.